milestones of life and adulthood, such as marriage and home buying and childbearing. And student debt, of course, stays with you for a long time. Uh, fortunately, our guest today, Bill Hansen, is recognized as a national leader in the education sector, including involvement in organizations that support higher education access and success. Bill brings more than 30 years of involvement in K-12 and post-secondary education for the wonderful work he's doing at USA Funds today, including his experience with 12 years in public service and 20 years in the corporate and nonprofit sectors. Um, he served as Deputy U.S. Secretary of Education from 2001 to 2003, acting as the department's chief operating officer. And he played a key role in implementing the landmark No Child Left Behind Act and helped the Education Department earn its first ever independent clean financial audit. No small accomplishment there. Uh, Bill's been the president and CEO of USA Funds since July 2013. Uh, we had a great conversation at lunch, and although he is relatively new to central Indiana, I think you'll find that he's a pretty passionate Hoosier uh, today. He's a ter terrific resident here. Since 1960, the Indianapolis-based USA Funds have served more than 22 million people, making more than $250 billion available in financial aid for higher education. Historically, USA Funds has been known as a student loan guarantor, but it's now moving past that role as of the beginning of this year and increasing its focus on a new mission called Completion with a Purpose, and I think Bill's going to talk to us a fair amount about that today. It's a multifaceted initiative that aims to decrease the percentage of students who start but do not finish post-secondary education, prepare students for a more successful transition into today's workforce, and really tries to get at solving some of the core problems that students, employers, and higher education are currently experiencing. Its new guiding principle of completion with a purpose, we'll find out how USA Funds is adhering to its historic mission, while, as all of us need to do from time to time, retooling, redesigning, and re-strategizing in response to changes in the student loan industry, the needs of students themselves, uh, and a rapidly evolving and changing world. So please join me in welcoming Bill Hansen, President and CEO of USA Funds. Well, David, thank you for that kind introduction, and it really is um, an honor to be with you all today, and I still feel like a bit of an adolescent. I've been here for three and a half years in uh, Indiana, and I have ten grandchildren, and uh, all of them are under eight years old, so um, I'm hopefully not quite as rambunctious as they are, but I still feel like I'm uh, cutting my teeth literally here, and I just want to thank uh, you, and I just uh, always hope that you know what a wonderful uh, Jewel, Indiana, and Indianapolis are um, in our uh, in our nation, and I've had some deep friends and deep relationships uh, from Indiana over the years. And um, actually, when I left the role of deputy secretary at the Department of Education in 2003, it was actually former Mayor Steve Goldsmith was working for a company called ACS, and Steve is the one that recruited me uh, to go to ACS. And uh, and then when I came here, the first person that I turned to was. Uh, Probably my closest Indiana colleague, uh, Carol D'Amico, uh, when we uh, served together uh, back in 2001 to 2003. But um, uh, just uh, I'm grateful for Carol, and just uh, again, I think we've got a national treasure with her as our leading uh, workforce uh, development uh, expert in this country. And um, I would also like to recognize Bill Neal uh, from our board of directors, who is uh, our board of trustees, who is here uh, with us today as well. And, just very grateful for the leadership of our, our board and uh, the vision uh, that they uh, have for us and where we're uh, going as a company. Um, a lot of you are uh, probably wondering a little bit about what USA Funds is, and I, uh, you know, we're probably still a little bit of a, I think, a, a well-kept secret here in Indianapolis on the one hand, but nationally, as David indicated, we have been a, an incredible leader in the higher education and especially the student loan space since 1960. And um, our uh, great leaders, going back to John Burkhart, who had the, uh, the vision uh, to set USA funds up in 1960, this is a very interesting time in our country. Uh, in 1957, uh, the Russians launched Sputnik, and it really got America kind of doing a quick crash course in what was important to us. Uh, to keep up with them, uh, both militarily, but also from an education and an economic standpoint. And 
a lot of things uh, started in motion, and Congress, um, a year later, for the first time ever, uh, other than the GI Bill, created the first uh, federal student loan program called the National Defense Student Loan Act, and that was um, then built upon uh, in 1965 when uh, London Johnson was president and a lot of the Great Society programs were created, and uh, that's where the big student loan, the guaranteed student loan program that most of you are um, aware of uh, was created. But it was really these pioneers uh, here in Indianapolis uh, with uh, Mr. Burkhart and some of his colleagues that really were looking out for the low income students and for those that couldn't afford to go to college and were also looking forward to the whole college um, landscape changing from the old traditional model where uh, 60 years ago half of our students went off to private colleges and universities and half went to public universities. Today it's about 90-10 and those going off to public universities including the community college system. But what they did was they really helped develop this infrastructure and to show that this guaranteed notion uh, to help leverage private capital um, would be able to open the doors for students of uh, all backgrounds. And, um, and this was really the goal of the Great Society programs, in essence, was to help uh, end the war on poverty and to help level the playing field and give opportunity for um, all Americans across uh, this country. And, so when 1965 came along um, and the program was first created, that really built the foundation for 1972 when the Pell Grant program was created and the national infrastructure uh, was further expanded. USA Funds was really well positioned to go national and that's exactly what we've done. We were the designated guarantor in about a dozen states over the years, but we were also a national uh, guarantor and as David said, we provided uh, $250 billion, and that's with the B, to over 22 million students um, over the years. And so really a huge um, impact that we uh, were able to make. And you fast forward uh, to about 2009, um, uh, the new president at the time and the new Congress uh, decided the federal government should take over um, uh, all of the student loans in this country, and they did. And so almost overnight, with a stroke of a pen, uh, the public-private partnership that was put together for the previous 50 years uh, was pretty much um, unraveled. And so the federal government stepped in to make all of these loans directly. And for companies like USA Funds, our business uh, was frankly uh, taken away from us literally overnight. Um, we did have uh, the benefit from a business standpoint and a philanthropic standpoint that we still had a billion, $100 billion in our portfolio of loans that we were managing. So since 2009, we've been uh, winding down uh, as the loans are paid off uh, our business, but we've really been sitting on a burning platform. And so when I interviewed for this job uh, back in uh, about this time in 2013, yeah, I really was looking at this as a very interesting opportunity with my background um, in uh, education and government and business uh, to really uh, th uh, be thinking about what uh, could you do with this uh, uh, platform of an asset base of over a billion dollars with the mission that's going away and where is the blue ocean or what is the greatest need that we have in this country to try to uh, address and I really had three things that really uh, were sticking out at me that um, I thought were big national problems and the first one is that we have about five million unfilled jobs in this country um, of employers that are looking for uh, um, uh, graduates uh, but they don't have the skill sets they need to fill these jobs. And we've been in this very rugged economy for the last 10 years, and I just really thought it was a national tragedy that we um, uh, do not have our higher education system and our workforce system aligned. And so that was one area that I thought uh, uh, we could make a difference in. The other is we also have 36 million working adults who have had some higher education but no degree. And Again, uh, with this rugged economy for the last 10 years, and as a father of six kids and five in-law kids that are all 22 to 36 years old, I see it firsthand. None of them are in my basement right now, but I, um, uh, they have been. Um, for, um, but it is real, and it's a very different economy uh, than when I got out of college um, in the early 1980s and was going through college in the late 1970s. And just the opportunities just didn't seem to be there. And so it's not just this number of 36 million working adults who are looking to retool or to get back to college, but it is also uh, uh, compounded by this rugged economy for the last 10 years. They haven't had the same job opportunities, haven't had the same uh, career opportunities. 
So in some ways, we've almost got this cohort of people that have kind of been pent up for 10 years um, and kind of held back, frankly, from really um, realizing uh, their dreams and their aspirations and what they would like uh, to be doing. And the third segment of uh, students uh, that I've really um, been concerned about is the six million what we call disaffected students around this country. And these are mostly the low income disadvantaged students who have nobody in their family that's ever gone to college and mostly nobody that's never even had a job in their family. And so these were really the three uh, populations in the three national areas that I felt um, strongly about that we needed to go after and that we needed to help make a difference as an organization. And again, we are a pretty unique organization. Um, there are other organizations like us out there, but um, I sometimes call us a unicorn, but we are a large nonprofit organization and uh, we're really, um, but we're also a large business. And um, so you can think of companies like the Education Testing Service or ACT or the College Board, which are other large businesses that are in the nonprofit realm, but really making an impact um, in their realm. And so that is what we've really been looking to do. Um, I'm gonna get into a little bit about what we've been doing the last three years since I've been here, but um, we did have some very big news um, on January 1st, as uh, David indicated, where we actually stepped away and transferred our legacy business of a $50 billion student loan portfolio to a company called Great Lakes uh, up in Madison, Wisconsin, and they're doing some of the federal government servicing, so they're gonna be in the program for a long time. But it was very helpful for us to frankly uh, shed uh, uh, the burdens and challenges and to let another organization who is really gonna be doing this into the future to really help uh, these students as they continue through uh, their repayment. Uh, processes and to allow us to uh, really launch uh, into the areas that I just identified and to really help uh, make a difference and really lengthen our stride to help us get there. So we've uh, been about a, a couple of um, major ventures these last couple of years and really putting the building blocks in place to where this day finally came where we're exiting our, our legacy business. and. We are really centering all of our work around what I'm calling completion with a purpose. And there is some great work going on around this country on the world of completion. And I don't want to ever say we checked off the box on student access, but really what we've done with our 55 year uh, legacy and our history, I do believe that our country, we're unique in the world where we have two thirds of our students uh, graduated from high school going off to some type of a post-secondary uh, opportunity. It's really the completion area that I think is most um, challenging for us. And so when I talk about completion with a purpose, it's really to help high school students in particular make the right decisions of whether it's to go to a vocational or a certificate or other two-year type of training, whether to go to a four-year school, what type of degree to get, what type of financing to get, and what type of career or job is all of this gonna lead to and to help them make uh, those right decisions along the way. So we have really built ourselves around three uh, key areas. One is philanthropy that uh, Carol is uh, in charge of. The second is national engagement that Carol's in charge of. She's in charge of everything. Um, <laughs> and the third is developing our new business enterprise and to, again, make this social impact and this social uh, difference to um, helping students succeed. And let me just give you a brief um, overview of a couple of the philanthropic uh, areas in particular that have been uh, under Carol's um, wing. Um, we really have uh, worked uh, a lot here in Indianapolis and in the state of Indiana with wonderful leaders like Teresa Lubbers and um, uh, the data program and the college um, uh, ranking program that has been put together here in Indiana under her leadership is really a national treasure. Um, the, in Washington, they passed this law to create kind of this national report card, but there are incredible gaps in it. And really under the leadership uh, uh, with uh, Teresa and with some of the grant funding and other things that we've been able to support uh, her with, uh, this really is a national um, model for uh, both the federal government but for other states to, um, uh, to launch into. We also um, have worked very closely with uh, um, uh, uh, Governor, uh, President Daniels at Purdue University and creating the Polytechnic uh, High School that's gonna be opening up on the east side here this fall. And this is such a great partnership with Mayor Hogsett here in um, uh, the city. Uh, but again, this is gonna be, I think, a very innovative STEM uh, uh, related high school uh, that again is gonna be a great partnership uh, helping uh, high school kids get college credits while uh, they're in high school. 
We also have been working uh, with Teresa on a, another initiative here that again I think is a, a showcase for the country uh, where we've been really working with the 21st century scholars um, uh, which are the, the low income first generati uh, uh, generation students here in Indiana going to college. Uh, again with a grant uh, to support uh, this activity and uh, bringing in a company called Inside Track that really helps coach and mentor uh, these first generation kids that don't have the infrastructure that most of us in this room would have uh, to help. Um, and again, I've got my younger two kids in college right now and it's easy for me to text them or pick up the phone if they're having a problem. Uh, they've got a great network of friends that they can lean on. A lot of students, especially students of color and Hispanic students and first generation uh, students do not have that same uh, infrastructure. And so this grant uh, was very important uh, uh, to help uh, reach out to um, uh, those populations as well. We also have been uh, working across the board uh, in a number of states uh, to, uh, even though we're Indiana-centric, we are a national uh, organization doing national work. And I'm just very, very proud of the, uh, the work that we're doing across the country. We've launched a competency-based education initiative in uh, Missouri and Nevada, building on similarly what you've got here with Western Governors uh, University in Indiana. Uh, we launched a, a very important statewide uh, STEM initiative in the state of Hawaii. Um, we've got a career pathway project for life sciences in the state of Utah. Uh, we've launched a project to reduce the need for remedial education uh, with the governor of Delaware. And in Montana, we've launched several important programs, but uh, the two that I'm most proud of are to accelerate the uh, degree completion for veterans um, and also apprenticeships for tribal uh, students. And Montana has the uh, largest number of tribal colleges in the country. And I just was with Governor McAuliffe uh, before the election to launch a project in Virginia to help young adults who are no longer in school uh, work their way back uh, through the community college system and other pathways uh, to help get a, a quality job in, um, uh, in the state. So we're very uh, proud of the philanthropic work uh, that we've been about and, um, and also the national engagement work uh, that we've been about. I want to just tell you a little um, story about some of the businesses that we're getting into right now. Um, the first one um, is a company called Road Trip Nation. It's out in Laguna Beach, uh, California, and some of you may have seen uh, their television show. It's on uh, PBS. They've been airing uh, these road trips on PBS for 13 years now. They have a best-selling book uh, um, uh, called Roadmap on the New York Times best-selling list. But this company was started by three surfer dudes in Pepperdine. Uh, they were on the water polo national championship team uh, in 2001. Um, but after, when they were graduating uh, from college, uh, they went and stole their dad's uh, motorhome uh, and painted it this uh, lime green and drove across the country with this idea that they wanted to interview uh, individuals such as you in this room, uh, business leaders, education leaders, uh, uh, government leaders, uh, normal people and to really find out what their pathway in life was and what their secret sauce was, what their passions were. And this has turned into to be a very uh, incredible business and they've got an incredible data archive um, of these interviews that really help high school students and college students and uh, people such as us give us some ideas about the pathways in our life. And this was our first acquisition uh, that we uh, made last year uh, to help us create um, our new business and our, uh, our new uh, future. And I just wanted to uh, show a, a brief clip of, um, this is a short two minute clip about a, a roadmap of uh, veterans coming back to civilian life and it's called The Next Mission and it has been showing on PBS the last couple of uh, months. No one can stay in the military forever. We all get out one day. It's just something that we don't think about, though. When you go back to civilian life, it's different. It took me a while to overcome my depression and the realization of I'm out. When I got hurt, everything was stripped from me. It was taken away in an instant. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I feel like an alien. I feel like I'm not even from this world. What's my next step? Where's my next calling? What am I going to do now? And be passionate about it like I was passionate about the military. So we're going to be going on a road trip. We're going from the West Coast to the East Coast. And we're going to be interviewing veterans along the way. Gaining experience and knowledge about their transition to the civilian life. The hardest part about transitioning for me was becoming an individual. Instead of focusing on, you're never going to do this again. Look at all the things you can do. 
Your greatest weapons are right here and in here. We learn to face our fears and so use those things we learned in the military to not just live in the civilian world, but thrive. These people, they are really just down to earth, amazing people. This is for home defense in case ISIS comes after us. <laughs> <laughs> Setting out across the country, bonding with all the amazing veterans, it's therapeutic. I even hate categorizing it, military life, civilian life. Everybody has different roads and avenues, it's life. This has been 30 days, and it's been many things, and I'm excited to see what the future has. I'm forever changed. Those last few tags are important to show the partnership that we do have uh, with the public television um, and with PBS. So, but this is an important uh, part of who we are um, uh, going forward. And this is again uh, the first um, uh, acquisition that we brought into the, the new USA Funds family. Uh, we also have brought into the family um, a company in Cincinnati called Education at Work. This is a nonprofit company. It's frankly a call center, but it's kind of a work-study program for, um, again, helping low-income uh, individuals come in and uh, uh, do inbound call center work for major national clients. And this gives them an opportunity to learn team building skills, uh, other life management skills, uh, get paid for doing this, but also if they keep their GPA up um, at a certain level to be able to get the scholarship for each semester that will hopefully help keep them uh, out of debt. And we really wanted to take this platform nationally. That was the vision of this and why we brought it into to use our national footprint. And uh, back in May, we launched our first uh, major um, initiative with Arizona State University. It's a small school of 75,000 students. Um, um, and, and again, with a very important uh, uh, client uh, that we're working with, it's a national uh, name and we're looking to replicate this opportunity um, around the country. We also um, um, did a, uh, pretty much a, a startup company uh, called Student Connections, and very proud of this. This is a spin-off of some of the work that we've been providing to colleges over the years, uh, but we just opened up um, this new business in Castleton. Uh, I think actually the, the public uh, unveiling is this Thursday, uh, but very proud of uh, this company and what we're doing to help uh, and financial literacy for default prevention and debt management and other uh, types of needs to help students and universities uh, stay on track. Um, the third piece of what we've been doing is also in our investment and thought leadership. And as we're looking to the future um, and, and looking to where uh, the changes are in our country, um, uh, we actually invested uh, again with Purdue in a uh, with the, the Back of Boiler program. It's a, a new kind of student loan program, and it's not a loan, it's called an income share agreement. And this is to really help give students more information on the front end. It's to help bring outside investors in that are gonna take a bet on that student and what their degree is, what the marketplace is looking like, and to put together a package uh, that will make sense for that student so the student will not be saddled uh, with the prospects of uh, uh, a ridiculous debt uh, throughout their life that they'll never get out of. And this is an innovative uh, pilot program uh, that we've started and again is the type of thing that uh, we think could go national and could be help uh, be a part of the, the national infrastructure um, in the $180 billion uh, student loan annual spend that this country uh, puts together. So um, we think this is a very important um, initiative as well. I'd like to um, uh, close by um, uh, just commenting that uh, bringing all this back to why this is important for you in the room. And again, I've spent my 36 years um, in the uh, private sector, in the business, as many as you are, in the education sphere uh, that many of you are in, and also in the government sphere. And I think, and also as our role of uh, being parents or being community-minded individuals, these are the four hats um, that are very important to all of us and to uh, you in the room as we each have, I think, a stake in this uh, a uh, very important venture to help get this right and to help um, improve the prospects for all of our students in this country and especially those who are in uh, greatest need. And, and I just, uh, I love the old adage that um, uh, um, you know, all boats will be lifted through um, uh, uh, with, a, with a rising tide. And I 
Um, uh, a few months ago, you had uh, uh, Senator Dick Luger and former Congressman Lee Hamilton here, and they shared the podium and talked about some of the political and social uh, challenges that confront us. And their answer uh, together was uh, uh, just some good old uh, economic growth. And that's really what we're aiming to, to work on. And again, we are a billion dollar plus enterprise in a sea of uh, $500 billion of the higher education enterprise nationally every year. And I sometimes ask myself, am I being too ambitious? Or are we being um, uh, too Pollyannish <laughs> that we can actually help make a difference in this area? And I, the answer is yes. And I think that's what we're looking to do each and every day is how do we leverage in the engagement work and our philanthropic work and our business work to move the needle. And it's really working uh, with people such as you in this room who are in the education space, the government space, the business space, to try to leverage this change. And if I just think about this, uh, the first national problem I talked about, of it's not just, you know, there's a lot of work and uh, numbers out there about the unemployment rate going down, but we still have a major challenge economically in this country with the 10 years of um, our struggling economy. And it's not just the quality of jobs or the quantity of jobs, it's the quality of jobs uh, that we're looking for. And so these 5 million unfilled jobs I'm talking about, if we're able to get our higher education system and our workforce systems aligned uh, with the data, with the graduates uh, coming out, um, I really believe that this will take our GDP problems that we've been happy with 1 or 2% growth these last uh, 10 years. Um, this would really help propel us um, and to, I think, really be uh, an incredible uh, shot in the arm for our country and from our economic prosperity, which translates to individual prosperity, uh, which uh, we should all be about of helping to, to lift the, the boat for everybody that uh, we serve. Um, I just am uh, very optimistic that I think about the theme of today, it really is change. Um, we've got a lot of change that we just witnessed uh, uh, going on around this country um, uh, in Washington. Uh, we've got a lot of change uh, going on to technologically, a lot of change at the higher education institutions, a lot of calls for there to be more accountability and uh, more affordability on college campuses, more transparency. Um, and for our company as well, we've just had a 56-year uh, sea change for our company. And so um, I just think it's important for us to embrace this change and to look for ways in which we can uh, help uh, uh, change the world, change our country, change our city, change the lives of individuals uh, that we work with. And I tell you, I um, was just so struck last Thursday, I was um, at the Indiana State Society Ball in Washington, uh, and it was such uh, an honor to be there with Governor uh, Pence and uh, his wife, um, but to also be encircled by um, uh, a couple thousand Hoosiers that were in the room. But it was... Um, uh, just amazing to see the legacy of, uh, I think, Vice President Quill, and I can't remember if it was he or Governor Pence, that, or Vice President Pence that said this, but we've had 48 vice presidents uh, in our history. Six of them um, are Hoosiers, and if you think about that, that's one out of eight. And um, where I come from in Virginia, I'm always very proud of uh, all the Virginia presidents, but um, I actually think it's pretty cool that uh, we should be very uh, proud of all of the, for the vice presidents from the uh, state of Indiana. But it was also uh, wonderful to be there with uh, Senator Donnelly and Senator uh, Young and Governor Holcomb. And just, I hope you know, um, as I go out around this country uh, to be um, viewed of what a national leader Indiana is uh, as a thought leader, an economic leader, uh, um, uh, an education leader, uh, with some of the greatest educational uh, enterprises um, uh, that are here in this state. And I just, um, uh, really believe that all roads are going to go through Indiana in some respects as we try to get these problems solved. And I think it's going to be, um, I was sitting there at the ball on Thursday night just thinking, wow, we're going to have uh, just a, an opening for there to be uh, really a, an Indiana-centric um, footprint on uh, what we're doing in so many fields, but especially uh, here in education. And I just uh, want to thank you for all that you do in your uh, respective uh, uh, jobs, again, whether it's in government or at the education level or in business or in your local community and with your family. Um, it really is going to take all of us um, uh, working together to really look forward to the huge changes that are impacting uh, our higher education system. And we really need to modernize um, our higher education system to take into account these challenges uh, that I uh, mentioned. And I, I just, I'm 
grateful for this chance every day that I have to, to work with the great team at USA Funds and to work with um, our uh, uh, great employees and uh, the management team that we have uh, as we're really trying to drive this change uh, nationwide. Thank you very much, and David, I guess we'll have some questions. at some point, um, but if not, and certainly to start, I've got a couple I'd like to ask you myself. Uh, again, though, for those of you who have questions, please use the white cards on your table or tweet us at, at Economic Club IM. Um, Bill, let's talk for just a minute about where you were on, on Thursday and Friday last week, and that's a Washington, D.C. is a city you know pretty well, uh, and the Department of Education is a place you know pretty well, too. Obviously, that is a, an agency that's much in the news right now, and a lot of focus on the incoming secretary and really more issues of, I would say, K-12 education and higher education, at least in the public debate right now. But what is the role of the Department of Education in higher education and the kinds of issues that you are thinking about today as well as something like you thought about for Pisa? That's a great question, David. And, um, you know, I think it's important to note that the U.S. Department of Education, it A, hasn't been around forever. It was created in 1980, um, the year before Ronald Reagan came in and he campaigned on abolishing it. Um, but it really serves some very important roles um, in helping um, our special ed uh, students around the country, helping our K-12 uh, students, um, helping protect the civil rights um, uh, of American students, uh, but then also in higher education. And, in K through 12, only about 8% of K-12 spending, we spend about $600 billion a year on education nationally, only 8% comes from Washington. And almost all that money is either targeted towards research and innovation or to special needs kids. And that's really what Secretary Designate DeVos has been focusing on is to help um, uh, give states and families more flexibility on how to uh, leverage those uh, limited federal dollars uh, through school choice or, or charter uh, schools. In higher education, it's a very different story. There's about $150 billion in student loans that are made every year, um, another $30 plus billion dollars in Pell Grant and institutional aid made every year. Um, it's much closer to about 30 or 40 percent of uh, the spending in higher education. And so with that, there's much more of potential strings attached to what uh, goes out the door um, in higher education. And so on issues like affordability, accountability, the accreditation processes, that's really where um, I think you'll see most of the potential uh, debate uh, centered in higher education is, um, uh, again, I think there's gonna need to be a real look. Our, most of our Pell Grant and student loan systems were built 55 years ago around 18 to 24 year olds going to traditional uh, public and private four year schools. Um, we have, a lot of um, important uh, innovations going on around this country with boot camps and other type of uh, training companies that will, um, uh, and the fact we've got these working adults uh, that need to go back to school and can't go back to a traditional college, so we've got the um, explosion of online opportunities. And that's where I think most of the focus uh, will hopefully be is to try to modernize uh, the financial aid and accreditation and the, um, accountability processes to help spur change and not smother change. And I, and I really frankly believe that a lot of the federal programs in the last couple of years have been smothering change, smothering innovation. And if I had a magic wand for the new secretary and the new Congress, it would be to really help them figure out ways to uh, spur change, spur innovation, spur modernization versus smothering all those mm -hmm. issues. And, and you, you mentioned in your remarks uh, both uh, uh, current president, former governor, Mitch Daniels, and also Purdue, um, he, as you know well, uh, and you know him well, uh, he annually publishes an open letter to uh, supposedly the citizens of Purdue, but really pretty much everybody in the state. And the theme this year uh, in particular was on innovation, but the theme for him every year really is in looking at higher education and four-year in particular undergraduate education and trying to figure out how to make it worth it. Uh, and how to make it frankly worth the kind of debt that people are incurring to, to go to higher education institutions. In, in, in both your experience um, at the federal level, but also what you're doing now, what about that side of the equation? What, are, are, you, are you 
thinking about and giving advice to higher education leaders in terms of how they need to change, how their mission, like your mission, needs to be in evolution? Yeah, David, I, um, it's a great question. I failed to mention uh, one of our, I think, our most important initiatives uh, that we're going to be launching and stay tuned in the next month or so. But we've been engaged with the Gallup organization. It's uh, the most prestigious and oldest uh, polling company uh, in America. And we have about 100,000 interviews um, that have been conducted and that we'll be uh, doing about 10,000 a month. And really, this new first of its kind daily education tracking poll is going to be the voice of the consumer. And uh, we've got all these other wonderful measurements out there of inputs and outputs. Um, but I really believe it's the voice of the consumer that is the most important voice that's been missing from all of our policy debates, um, all of uh, 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 the different initiatives that are out there, and until we get the voice of the consumer and figure out a way to also communicate uh, with that voice of the consumer, um, we're going to be missing uh, the mark. And I, again, uh, Purdue uh, had the Purdue Gallup Index, which was, again, kind of a pioneering um, uh, step in this direction uh, uh, to really help, especially uh, with alumni, uh, better understand uh, uh, you know, what the value of their degree was and what pathway it helped uh, get them uh, propelled in line. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, Bill, on the, on the policy side, again, even today, there's an important meeting going on in, in, uh, in the Oval Office uh, with leaders of the automotive industry about keeping jobs here or bringing jobs back from somewhere else. And reshoring or avoid, avoiding outsourcing is obviously a topic of, of huge pertinence here, but so is automation. Uh, and that's an issue that has not yet been discussed very much, and yet I think for a number of our employers here, uh, we see increasingly that the nature of work itself is changing, and the skills that are for that students and people coming out of higher education need to have are radically different from what they were a few years ago. Can you talk a little bit about, and I know you believe that too, but can you talk a little bit about how some of the new programming that you, you're doing at USA Funds is going to address that, that particular issue? Yeah, it's a very important um, area, and there's, uh, again, some great organizations around the country, the University Innovation Alliance and some others uh, that are really working to try to um, uh, bring the voices of uh, college presidents and leaders uh, together to address these issues. But um, this is also um, something that we're really looking at from a, a business uh, standpoint to how we can really uh, transform the amount of data uh, that is out there, um, uh, uh, both at the, the government level, but also at the institutional level, and frankly, at the business level, and how can we and really better use uh, this data and utilize this data to drive uh, the transparency for families, but also to drive decision-making um, uh, opportunities. I think the one thing that I, I just, uh, again, go back to is it's not even trying to align our current uh, 5 million jobs, uh, but it's also looking down uh, the road five years from now and understanding what are going to be our manufacturing, our technology, our other jobs. And it's the kids that are graduating from high school this year that are going to be in that pipeline um, of what our economy, what our jobs are going to look like five years from now. And uh, again, to get um, those systems aligned so that universities can also start maybe um, uh, pivoting a little bit to try to draw more students into uh, those degree programs that will um, uh, uh, help shape those students for the future job opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I also tell you, this: um, there's some really important things. I touched on one of them with competency-based education. and I. I, I do believe that this is really uh, an important um, uh, movement for our country. Um, Western Governors University, I think nationwide, has about 60,000 students. Um, I went to their graduation ceremony a few years ago, and the average graduate was 36 years old, and we were in the Huntsman Center, and uh, with 20,000 people, and I think 15,000 of them were babies, um, and it was probably the most boisterous in a different way of a, a graduation ceremony that I'd ever been in. But, um, but we really need to look at different models um, to really go out and again, uh, not just look at the high school graduates, that's very important, but to look at our broader population and what we can do to um, uh, open up those same opportunities where we're going to have the business openings down the road. And, and probably also to continue to look at the business models themselves Absolutely. and see how they're changing and going through transformation as well. Yep. So here's a question for you via Twitter. Donald uh, Trump? No, no, it's not. I don't think so. Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's looking for some free advice. Uh, how do we curb rising textbook costs? A 
$350 textbook is nearly $11 a day for, two, for a two-day class every week. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not an expert on this, but I will tell you the textbook industry between Houghton Mifflin and McGraw-Hill and Pearson, this is an issue that they're wrestling with every day. Um, these are big, multi-billion dollar publicly traded giants. Um, but it really, you know, trying to take textbooks digital um, uh, is a very important priority. And again, I look at my 10 grandchildren, they're all under eight years old, and my little two-year-old uh, granddaughter knows how to use this thing better than I do and uh, figure out uh, uh, where to go and how to do things. And I, I just, it's gonna be uh, the way of the future. I also have a 34-year-old daughter who's a school teacher and again, just the difference in the way that old people like me at 57 are wired versus the way she's been taught um, to use uh, technology and tools are uh, very different. So it's, uh, I do think the textbook industry is either going to be left in the dust or uh, hopefully they'll be able to modernize themselves and to you know, continue to create the digital platforms uh, that they need. And it really, uh, you know, it's a cost issue, but it's also an efficiency and it's a, a learning uh, tool issue as well. There's a question on student loan debt. I'm not surprised we got one since both you and I used some pretty frightening statistics <laughs> out there. Uh, one that I actually didn't use, uh, but that is, I think, pertinent for this question is that of the student loan debt that's currently uh, outstanding, and there was a national report in the last couple of days, that like 50% of it at this point either is going unpaid or hasn't had a single dollar paid on it in principal for the past seven years. So not only is it a big number, it's a big number that's, that, that is, is, is begging to what's gonna happen next. This question is wondering uh, what percent can we expect will be repaid and if we don't fix this problem, could we end up with a financial crisis as we had with mortgage debt in 2008, 2009? Yeah, it's, um, it's very important and I even go back, um, you know, more than a decade earlier when we had the savings and loan crisis. I, I don't know if you all remember the early 1990s with that, but that was all over about $100 billion. <laughs> and it really uh, was an unsettling uh, time when we were also in a kind of a down economic time. But um, I, I do believe that there are some challenges out there. We have had a bit of a, there's been a lot of national conversations about free college, and those are important conversations and about uh, debt-free college. And that is a very important uh, conversation to have uh, prospectively, but um, we do need to make sure, and I think, again, one of the things is information for students, that they understand um, that this is a loan, not a grant, mm -hmm. uh, what their obligations are. And, you know, on the one hand, if you are able to get a college education, your earnings are going to be at least three times that of a high school student. And so I think, um, you know, we've had a bit of a national conversation these last couple of years about to borrow as much as you want, take as long as you want to pay it back, and when all is said and done, we'll forgive it, versus um, this is a, a, a gift to you right. <laughs> to help you from a human capital standpoint to go and make yourself better. You're going to be better off, and you know, it just, you know, why um, a labor uh, workers' taxes should be paying for somebody that's, you know, gone out and got a, a higher education uh, and then default on their student loan um, uh, in a flippant way is just um, um, uh, is not the answer. And so I think uh, part of this is cultural, part of this is um, making sure uh, that uh, students also understand the obligation they have, but also uh, the benefit that they're gonna have from being able to, to get a college education and they're gonna be much more uh, better off than their next door neighbor that didn't have the chance uh, to go to college. So. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, with the $1.4 trillion in debt and growing $150 billion every year, um, it, it's a, a very important topic and, uh, you know, one that was on the campaign trail and yeah, I think it's going to sure be is. probably the, the top issue in higher education that's going to be confronting the new administration. Mm -hmm. And it confronts a wide array of, of people, a wide array of citizens. Um, question for you on, on what's the role of participation and funding programs for students at for-profit institutions. Uh, and, and how is, what, what role can sort of third parties and folks in the, in the funding sector and program sector play in making sure that those institutions also are, are really providing a product of use since it's often a product that's fairly expensive? Yeah. That's a great question and again, um, there are a lot of uh, wonderful organizations out there, especially in the technical and uh, training worlds that are helping uh, students, uh, again, through maybe more flexible means to be able to get uh, uh, the skill sets and, and the education that they need. 
but at the same time, there's a very important responsibility uh, for these organizations um, uh, to be accountable. And I think, again, that's really uh, the balance that of, of the federal programs in terms of getting them modernized. You know, having these one-size-fit-all programs, uh, you know, to fit Notre Dame or to fit a technical school or to uh, a public university, there needs to be, I think, a differentiated approach to um, how the programs are administered, uh, the types of degrees, the types of certificates that the students are getting. Um, and I think it's important to have all colleges accountable uh, for uh, the effective administration of this $180 billion of taxpayer money that's coming out every year. Mm -hmm. well, we have time for, uh, for one last question, and, and it's, it's serendipitous. Uh, this is another Twitter question. Um, and actually, when I uh, close this out here in just a moment, I'm going to announce that our next speaker for the Economic Club next month will be Dr. Sue Elsperman, uh, who is the new leader of uh, Ivy Tech Community College. This question is, with a new leader at Ivy Tech, uh, we have a chance to improve outcomes. What would you like to see done to achieve that? So keep in mind that people will be paying attention <laughs> next month. Well, that's Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Carol's a former uh, right. head of Ivy right. Tech. But, um, you know, actually, I think um, our community and technical uh, schools are going to be very important uh, uh, part of the solution uh, going forward. And I. Um, again, I think the flexibility, the um, ability to, um, you know, work with the working adults, especially the population that I mentioned, are, um, are very important. And I also just, again, um, uh, I'm just very grateful for Sue taking on this challenge with Ivy Tech because around this country, um, again, our community college systems are not all that old. A lot of them, most of them started up in the 1970s, expanded in the 1980s. And I think probably on about two hands you could count uh, what I would call the high quality um, of community colleges in our country. And it's kind of sad that there are a lot that have 6% job placement rates or graduation rates, and there are others that do a very effective job with it. And, um, and again, I think here in Indiana we're very fortunate with our total higher education system, including Ivy Tech. Um, we all have our challenges, but um, I, um, uh, I'm just very gratified that we've got great leaders at the helm and, and I think it's going to be the collaboration as well with the uh, again the business community the, the government leaders and the other uh, public and private institutions that are um, uh, really going to help make a difference. That's great. Well with that we're at our time. Bill thank you very much. Please join me. Before we begin our program today our, our uh, technical team put a second microphone on Bill so that his remarks could be recorded. Uh, that was successful and they will be broadcast on WFY Public Radio 90.1 FM on Saturday, February 11th uh, and can also be uh, available for download at WFY.org. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, kind of stole my own thing here, please join us next month, uh, Monday, February 27th for Dr. Sue Elsperman, the new leader of uh, Ivy Tech Community College. Uh, who's coming to talk with us about the changes she's preparing to bring uh, and enable students and workers to find better paying opportunities in the state. I think this is a terrific uh, dialogue we've started in the new year and look forward to that. Information and tickets for that program, as always, can be found on our website, economicclubofindiana.com. Our deal with you is you're out here by 1.30. It's 1.30. Thank you very much for coming. Tonight. So I hope that was okay. <laughs>